Yeah. You ready, Lynn? Okay. Lynn, are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right, it's 9.02 on uh, July 22nd. Uh, so we're uh, ready to call the meeting to order. I um, guess we need to do our roll call. Dr. Badoli? Here. Dr. Bazzini? Here. Dr. Coble? Here. Mr. Daniel? Here. Dr. Downing? Here. Dr. Drake? Here. I know she's. <laughs> Dr. Kerrigan? Here. Mr. Parsons? Here. All right. Meeting's called to order. First order of business is to review and adopt the uh, minutes from the previous meeting. I believe there was a correction that was made to the minutes. Um, so if that's electronic, I don't know if it's in hard copy. Um, the, the copy that is in the GoVend is correct. Okay. All right, so that said, um, is there a motion to uh, accept the minutes? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, the third um, business issue is the administrative update. Um, so you'll see in your meeting materials that we have um, a revised budget that includes expenditures for an upcoming reaccreditation assessment at Fort Worth PD. NAB suggested that the commission send a representative there for firearms in particular. So in your materials, you'll see a contract with Tim Scanlon, um, who is a former lab director in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, and has firearm specific expertise. So he will attend for us and observe and report back to the commission anything that um, occurs of note during that reaccreditation assessment. It's a full reaccreditation of the laboratory. Um, so that is included in there. Um, additional funds uh, or the, the completion of Tim Roig's work on the expert tax matter is reflected in there. We also have um, posted a position for a 10 hour a week uh, training coordinator to help us facilitate um, a number of training projects that we would really like to initiate in collaboration with Judge Hervey and the Court of Criminal Appeals on things like DNA training for lawyers, on the issue that came up in the James Smiley matter involving exclusion assessments for otherwise uninterpretable mixtures. There are a number of things that we would like to initiate um, that just take some logistical management. And we're very fortunate because, um, well, so far we've only had one candidate apply, but it's um, the former president of K-Law, uh, the Center for American and International Law, Mark Smith. And so, um, you know, we'll see, we'll, we'll do interviews for whoever applies, um, but I think that he ran all of the, the projects at Kale in Plano, including various forensic seminars, actual innocence, capital um, defense and prosecution seminars. So anyone who's been up there to Kale knows what I'm referring to. I think. A number of you probably have been to kill. I know that Mike and Bruce have. Mark, I don't know Jarvis. Who? Right. So you know Mark Smith, then, and yeah. So we'll see. Um, that's the thought. There is that he would force us. So what ends up happening is that you know investigations are take a lot of time and energy and some t like in any operation the training part tends to fall behind if you don't prioritize getting those logistics done so the thought is that he'll help us facilitate that and because he already has a relationship with the court of criminal appeals um, that is sort of a seamless transition as well so that's the thought there um, that's all reflected in the budget the database, um, it, we've seen it in uh, sort of beta testing, and it's looking really good. Um, 
OCA has, OCA's IT group, especially the programmers, have very many competing priorities. And so often they get um, pulled away to do something that's urgent, that's a legislative priority, or you know the Supreme Court may have a priority, or the CCA that comes ahead of us. So um, we do expect, we just got an updated timeline, and we do expect it to be, f by the next meeting, we should be able to demo it for you. So that is in the works. Sarah Kerrigan, who's online, has seen part of it already, the, the standards compliance piece. And I think she was happy with how it's coming along. Um, and so we're excited about it. We just need to get them to launch, which has been a little bit frustrating, but we're grateful for the work they've done because it's quite a sophisticated product. Um, Lee, do, we, do you have anything else? No, they gave us an updated schedule last night, but um, it's not much different than what we have in your materials. I wouldn't expect for the public side of it to be available until November. So later this year, all of it should be live. And that's just, like Lynn said, because of the competing projects that they have going on. We ha there's three people working on it, and they are literally the only three people that design programs for the entire court system in the state of Texas. So we're lucky we get to have them, but we got to share them too. So they got pulled aside for bail. They get pulled aside, you know, for various things that come up that are urgent. Um, but they're, they're, they want to get it done. I know that much. They are committed to getting it done. So we just have to keep plugging ahead. So do we need to make a motion to accept the uh, um, part-time position, or is that just but in budget, not we don't have to? I, it would be great if, because there have been some changes to the budget to reflect these things, it would be great if you would right. um, adopt readopt the budget in its current form. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the amended fiscal year 22 budget? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Aye. The fourth issue is the uh, discussion of pending complaints and laboratory disclosures. Mr. Daniel. Dr. Bernard, um, the uh, Complaints Disclosures Committee, consisting of myself, Dr. Drake, and Dr. Coble, uh, did not meet in advance this meeting primarily as a function of uh, the number of matters we had and, and the lack of necessity for a, a preliminary meeting. Uh, what we have before us today is one disclosure holding over from our uh, April meeting. We have uh, seven new matters that have come in since uh, April uh, that are disclosures, and then we have five complaints. So uh, our time on the agenda allots 75 minutes. This is not a race, but I think we can do it 40, 45. We'll see. Uh, our first matter is item number 2217. It comes from Fort Worth PD Crime Lab of Proficiency Testing Nonconformity. They forward us a non-disclosure in late March reporting a non-conformity conformity by ANAB during their review of monitoring records. Uh, the lab records that indicated that uh, certain proficiency test participants submitted their completed test uh, after the manufacturer published the consensus reports without going to great detail of all the uh, the work they did reviewing it, uh, we've already approved the uh, the contract with uh, Dr. Tim Scanlon to observe the the laboratory's next reaccreditation, which happens in the latter part of August 23rd through 25th. And it's my understanding part of our contract he will be present on site, observe that report back to us, and then we can likely address that at the next meeting. So. Uh, if there are any questions or no questions, comments, or concerns, I'm prepared to make that in the form of a, uh, a motion to accept the self-disclosure and also uh, approve our contract, which we sort of already approved <laughs> with Dr. Tim Scanlon. Any questions? If not, I'll make that in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. Lynn had a comment, I think. Aye. Oh, sorry, Lynn. No, I don't have a comment. Okay. I'm hearing echoes. I'm sorry. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. 
Uh, which brings us to our, our second. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Daniel. I completely forgot that we need a panel. So who would like to volunteer? We need three of you to do this PT one. Patrick, uh, thank you. I stay off this one for all yeah. cases. Yeah, I agree. Who else would like to? You, you can put me on it. I'm happy about that. Okay, Coble, Lucini, and no, I'll do it. Bernard's his name. Um, did you say yes, Jasmine? Dr. Drake? Yes, I can. Okay. Oh, excellent. So we have Lucini, Coble, Drake. Does that work? Yes, I'll, I'll make that in the form of a motion also. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Okay. I'd just like to note the voluntariness of this panel and like the way that we did that, as opposed to being voluntold. <laughs> you like that? No, we're not done with today. We're not yet. done with this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you run your office? Kind of so. Okay. Thought so. Yeah, thought so. Uh, which brings us to our second matter. It's number 22.08. It comes to the Bear County Criminal Investigation uh, Laboratory in their Forensic Biology DNA and CODIS unit. Uh, they had sent this to us way back in February. They discovered that their uh, Forensic Biology DNA section, uh, they found an analyst had failed to properly document several case files uh, and the specific reason for not entering that, entering that sample into CODIS. Uh, the lab set about to uncover some, some other gaps. They actually ran some numbers and found out that uh, in review of 25 cases, uh, by that analyst, an additional 31 cases from other analysts, they found four where the analyst made the correct decision concerning CODIS eligibility, but the documentation was not included in the case notes. The lab also found two other cases where analysts identified, identified foreign profiles that were not entered into CODIS, and they failed to include the decision documentation for those matters also. And then two other cases where some eligible uh, case work profiles were not entered into CODIS in favor of a legal sample. They set about to address this by way of corrective action. They uh, have modified their CODIS procedures. Uh, they added a requirement for training on, on profile eligibility. They added some requirements for profile entry into CODIS forensic database. They consulted with the CODIS state administrator uh, and decided to enter eligible profiles into SDIS and NDIS specimen categories as they were discovered under utilizing ND NDIS categories. Uh, they also added, added that step to the procedure as well and the analysts received training on those new procedures. Uh, I think I understand somebody from the lab is here if we had any questions or or they wanted to add anything to the to the matter. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I don't see Bear County, but I think they did a very thorough job. So well, it appears so. And in light of of their corrective action and and also the uh, the analysis and all their updates and their procedures, uh, if there aren't any further questions or comments, I'm prepared to make a motion to take no further action based on that. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Which brings us to our third matter, which is uh, case number 22.23. It comes from Missouri <laughs> County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab. Uh, it concerns seized drugs and expired chemicals. They discovered uh, back in the uh, middle part of May that they uh, had a stock solution of formaldehyde that um, you got to understand the date, October 31 in 1998 in the prior century uh, was expired and uh, they set about to determine how and why that happened. Uh, they figured out that employees provided no documented explanation as to why the solution expired before it was received. It was actually received back in uh, 2010 with the 1998 expiration date on it. They set about to look at some other chemicals, acetaldehyde, glycerin, and vanillin, and then they did some testing to compare the expired uh, chemicals with the uh, newly acquired chemicals didn't find any discernible uh, difference or, or, or concerns. Um, the quality testing on the main expired chemicals revealed the expected results for those same chemicals, and they ended up ordering new lots for each uh, 
each chemical. Um, the staff had recommended that we uh, include this disclosure, merge it with uh, self-disclosure 21.72, which would assist the laboratory in assessing the scope of nonconformities in their toxicology and seized uh, casework. Um, Y'all may remember 2172. I think we dealt with that in our January meeting. Am I correct, Lynn? Yes. Okay. And that's still pending. Am I correct? Yes. So uh, if there aren't any questions or comments or concerns, I would make that in the form of a motion that we merge this for further review and with our self-disclosure number 21.72. Any questions? Is there a, a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Daniel, before you um, continue, I did want to point out that in the budget that you approved, there are funds for a subject matter expert to assist with this because what they're dealing with in Brazoria County is, is fairly large in scope. And um, Recently, um, the chief toxicologist for the FBI, Mark LeBeau, was authorized to begin doing consulting work because he's in the, the tail end of his time at the FBI. So he may be a really good choice to help the laboratory get on track. So we have money set aside for that. Um, and I, you know, my hope is that we'll be able to help support them in their efforts to improve their SOPs and their test methods and so forth. We have any idea what kind of expenditure you're talking about? I think we have it uh, earmarked for 15K in the budget. But it's all, you know, subject to the procurement rules of the state as well. Sure. But I, um, I think we're going to be able to set up subject matter experts in who are sort of on retainer, says the general counsel of the Office of Court Administration to help us with questions as they come up. So that will be very handy to have that pool of experts there. But we don't need that as part of our action or motion today. No, I just wanted to let you know that in addition to Scanlon, in addition to Mark Smith, there's also money earmarked for Mark LeBeau should he decide to take the um, project on. So I would make a motion with regard to this matter that the commission uh, merge or include this self-disclosure for an investigation with previous self-disclosure 21.72 to assist the lab in assessing uh, these issues. Okay. Um, is there a second to that? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. <coughs> Which brings us to item 22.24, which also comes from Missouri County Sheriff's Office uh, Crime Lab. Uh, same date, back in middle May, they provide an instant report in their seized drugs section where an analyst uh, actually diluted a new standard. Uh, an analyst had used it as a reference material for casework earlier in the week without updating uh, the lab lot number on the traceability forms. Uh, the analyst did not realize they were using the incorrect lot number until case uh, work was uh, undertaken the following week. Uh, the lab set about to try to identify all the cases that were worked the week of the uh, latter part of January. They completed a corrected traceability form on each case, and each analyst and reviewer initial, initialed each form. They also placed the corrected form in each case file with a line uh, indicating striking through the incorrect traceability form. They have started identifying different methods for creating a more efficient process for documentation uh, during analysis. And just for lack of a better term, they're, they're sputtering out of the gate, but they're addressing a lot of issues and addressing them competently. So this falls in that same category. Staff had made a recommendation we take no further action in light of their root cause analysis and self-disclosure and corrective actions. If there aren't any questions or comments, I'm prepared to make that in the form of a motion that we take no further action. Hearing no uh, questions, is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Hearing no opposition, motion carries. Uh, which brings us to the, the uh, 
Item 5, it also comes from Missouri County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, uh, same date, May 18, 2022. They provided to the commission uh, a disclosure of an incident in their seized drug section where staff discovered analysts did not always uh, separately record verification of drug reference materials as the materials came to the lab. Instead, they filed some verifications in the same document used to record the retention time for the standards against samples from cases. Uh, since that time, they have undertaken a corrective action of modifying their standard verification log. They've identified all standards and reagents used in 2021, and where it's necessary, they recorded verification separately using a new standard, and they have an individual person who will verify all incoming standards. And uh, same situation, they're, they're uh, addressing some some necessary issues and that falls in the same category of uh, good corrective action. So if there aren't any further questions or comments, I'm prepared to make a uh, recommendation consistent with staff uh, that we take no further action by the root cause analysis and the corrective actions they've undertaken. Any further comments? I would make one comment, which is that we've received more self-disclosures from Brazoria County Sheriff's Lab in the last two commission meeting cycles than we did in the prior decade combined. So it may feel heavy right now, but they're doing what they're supposed to do to go in there, the new leadership is, and see you know what things need to be corrected and, and doing the right thing and trying to, to correct it. So that's good. All right. Is there a second? Seven. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Which is our, brings us to the next item, which is 22.29 for NMS uh, Labs in Grand Prairie. Uh, latter part of May, they uh, notified DPS in Westlaco, notified NMS Labs that a uh, evidence sample of uh, 0.04 grams of cocaine uh, supposedly received was not in its container when it arrived in Westlaco. And without a lengthy discussion. They did everything, Westlaco and NMS. They conducted a video review of the uh, intake. They did a vault card access records they reviewed. They did an entry log review. They did their lab information systems review, uh, more vault inventory and processing area and looked everywhere and shock, shock, it did not come up. Uh, They're going to add some additional camera areas to the processing areas and maybe that will help and um, uh, frankly in reviewing it I don't know what else they could have done they didn't do it, it was very thorough and um, staff had made a recommendation to us uh, that we take no further action in light of their analysis and their corrective action and if there are not any questions or concerns I will make that in the form of a motion any further comments is there a second All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Which would bring us to our uh, seventh matters, item 22.32. It comes out of the Houston Forensic Science Center. Uh, in early June, they had reported to us uh, an incident in, uh, in their forensic biology section where analysts inadvertently uploaded three blind quality control DNA profiles to NDIS. Y'all may remember. Uh, probably three years ago that they had provided us a presentation on their uh, using blind samples to uh, ensure quality. Uh, one of the profiles, uh, surprisingly, resulted in a hit to a profile out of a Tennessee lab, uh, as well as a Tennessee convicted offender hit. Uh, the analyst generated the profile from a biological item uh, purchased from a commercial vendor. Uh, they set about to review it, investigate it. They determined there was a miscommunication between the forensic biology section and the quality division, which resulted in the profiles not being identified as blind quality control samples uh, by the CODIS unit prior to the time they were uploaded. They also discovered three biology cases were completed but were not identified as blinds by the CODIS unit. Uh, they set about to put some procedures in place to prevent this from happening again. In the future, the blind quality control samples, uh, as they're purchased, the CODIS unit will be included in the communication regarding the samples uh, so that they're designated as the actual mock cases. 
and uh, their investigation was, was thorough, their corrective action was thorough. Uh, I don't know what else they could have done except to try to prevent in the future, which they've done. So with that, uh, if there aren't any questions or comments, uh, uh, staff had made a recommendation we take no further action on the basis of the analysis and the corrective action, and I'll mm -hmm. make that form of a motion. Uh, Mr. Daniel, I think that HFSC would like to share their perspective on what they learned during this process. Please. Good morning, y'all. Peter Stout, you know who I am. If I can get the microphone to behave, I'll be brief. Yikes, there it goes. So this is one of those spots where we have tried with FBI for years to figure out how to deal with blinds and the integration with CODIS. You also have a similar issue with blinds and APHIS the fingerprint database. So part of my commentary is in any venue I possibly can, attempting to say I am very happy to talk with FBI, anybody involved in this. We have talked some with DPS on the APHIS end of things from the state level at APHIS. And I think, again, there's resistance from FBI to how we manage these things through the database. Without that, we got a blind spot. Um, I think that sample going through is one tiny little window into the functioning of CODIS and an example of I'm not sure CODIS is working the way we think it is. In 25 years of running complex systems, what I have come to understand, complex systems, unless you are actively looking for where they are breaking, they're still breaking, you just don't know it. What we saw in this one is all kinds of things worked right. It was great. You know, the laboratory identified things right. Okay, we misidentified getting it with our CODIS unit. Shame on us and getting it identified, but we identified we had a weakness there, how that was working. All of the uploads to CODIS worked. The inter interactions within CODIS worked. Notifications worked. The part that I point out where I think this failed is this should have looked like a really weird hit at the other end of it. You've got a 2000 sexual assault that was part of a cold case uh, backlog reduction project in 2012. They got the CODIS hit to this uh, offender in 2016. I know all of this because I called up TBI and chased down the investigators on it and asked them lots of questions. Um, this is a guy that they know has been in Tennessee and Virginia. But that's it. So he shows up as a burglary in Texas in 2021. That that didn't elicit a question from the investigator calling us of what's up makes me ask a question. Why is that? You couple that with, I've talked with lots of laboratories, and I kind of forget, I know Brady, I've talked with um, Gary about the number of reference swabs that we see come into laboratories on CODIS hits. It's low. Labs all over the country note this, that the number of reference swabs we get on CODIS hits is low. What's up? Something, something is failing someplace. Why are CODIS hits not getting used potentially better? Now, it turns out the silence that we heard from TBI in this case worked out, you know, they had done stuff, there was nothing else they could do, the statute of limitations had long since expired on this case, they didn't have anything to offer for a burglary in Texas, so no, they just set it aside, nothing we can do, and didn't say anything about it, I, I'll grant them that, they got lots to do, but we don't know that silence from the silence of they never got the hit, they never acknowledged the hit, got lost in their email someplace, they actually did something with the hit, only it wasn't the right thing. Who knows? But pervasively, we don't know what happens with CODIS hits. There is no tracking of CODIS hits. Basically, once they've left the lab, they're shot off into a deep, dark hole, and we have no idea. So thank you for the venue to rant about this a little bit. But we got a hole there that I, we should find a solution to. You think about how much money is spent nationally on generating those CODIS hits. It's got to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. 
and we don't know where that stuff goes and what happens with it and how we could get better with it. And really managing blinds through all this is the difference of a field with a flag in it at the database level. This could be pretty easily managed. We already know one profile that hits and two profiles that don't. We could start with those. Um, but something's got to change. But we some, somehow we need to get FBI to the table to actually <laughs> seriously talk about this. So thank you for the opportunity to rant. Happy to answer any other questions on it. So, so Dean, I mean, this, is, this is not a new issue. Nope. No question. Right. Yep. Yep. Bruce, could you, I'm sorry, lean forward into the mic a little more? I've never been told I haven't been loud enough beforehand, so thank you. <laughs> he was going to say it anyway. Um, so, um, and, and, and you had in your write up like a 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's what I've heard out of some labs, is as low yeah. as like 4%. Yeah. So, so in some sense, I'm not sure this is a CODIS problem as much as everything that happens post-CODIS and maybe pre-CODIS in a way. Yeah. Because the database is making hits. It's just that we don't know what the samples that we're analyzing are of value right. for investigation or what happens afterward. But there's a big gap there, and no one knows what it is. And it's probably important to get that information. I would say. Because we're spending a lot, just the sexual assault kits, we're spending a lot of money. But if you look at the SECI data, from the number of kits, and then the number have gone to court, and, it, uh -huh. and that we don't know what's happening in between. But that's a very small number compared to the number of hits that, are, that have uh, come out of CODIS. And so we may not be cost effective or getting the full benefit that we could if we don't understand this, especially if it goes somewhere and it just sits because no one understands it. Or it sits because it's lost in somebody's email. Yeah. So, you know, I'd like to see some, I don't know what you can do here, but maybe at least within the states, start collecting data on what happens from, you know, the yep. get-go to the end of the process. And certainly, we could even, if we could do something even at the state yeah. level, as much as we could to understand. I mean, this is a big state. We make a lot of CODIS hits. Um, friends from other labs who are here? Brady or anyone? Is that consistent with your perception? Good morning. I'm Brady Bells with the DPS. Hi, it is. Yeah, there's um, a couple different things we've done over the years when it comes to tracking hits and the follow-up on hits. Uh, I mean, we've always shown that there is a gap between the information that we produce in CODIS and submit it to local law enforcement and then that follow up. Uh, at times, we utilize the department to utilize the Texas Rain to help with that. I know they have their SAC initiative as well. It's this in that space. Uh, from a lab perspective, we've talked about software and maybe leveraging sexual assault kit tracking software that we have. There's all the same players that are engaged in that space. Can we add it? just to generate the data. And I think Dr. Bill is right. There's, there's the pre end and then there's the post, right? Are they following up on the cases where they receive what is hit? But then the pre side, are, the, are we working the right cases and putting those cases into code is where we would expect follow-up with a lot So it is, it is an issue. Uh, it's something we've been tracking at the state level. Uh, we do have some things that we kind of work through, but there's some additional work that we can do in this space. Thank you. That's all I, I would like to commend HFSC on all their efforts toward these blind uh, quality control projects. They're really important in gathering data that's helpful. Um, so hopefully we can, I think this is just going to be a work in progress. And I feel like I've heard Rock Harmon give many talks on this subject. This is like his thing is follow-up of CODIS hits that just languish. Um, that's, all I, that's all I had on that. All right. I believe you made a motion. Yes. Motion's on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Sorry. <coughs> motion carries. Which would bring us to our eighth matter. It's uh, DPS uh, 
Westlaco on early June, DPS uh, Crime Lab Division Director Brady Mills uh, provided uh, information about several instances of lost or missing extracts and cuttings in the DPS Westlaco mm -hmm. lab. Uh, they look back way in September of 2021, where an analyst uh, went to receive certain ex re retrieve certain extracts and cuttings, and they could not locate three DNA extracts from that particular case. While trying to locate these items, they also discovered uh, two two by three envelopes labeled with the same case number and with barcodes attached. Uh, during the same time period, the laboratory staff were conducting annual evidence inventory. The completion the inventory, five extracts, cuttings from five different cases uh, could not be located. Uh, they uh, realized that the uh, extracts and cuttings, these are their findings was, that they did not impact the request analysis in case number L3M29862, which was the uh, subject case. Uh, they are in the process of performing a full inventory of all stored DNA evidence with L3M uh, category case numbers. Uh, they'll continue to investigate for any missing items or barcoding issues as they are discovered and will update or report those to us as is necessary. It appears to me the lab was uh, fairly thorough <coughs> in their review of the matter. Uh, staff had reviewed it thoroughly and made a recommendation to take no further action given the analysis and corrective action by the lab. If there are not any questions or comments, I'm prepared to make that in the form of a motion. Hearing no comments, is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Which brings us to our complaints. Uh, the first complaint is number 22.20 from Richard James Patz. Uh, against the Harris County Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, Mr. Patz had alleged some uh, misleading or incorrect testimony by a DNA an analyst involving a fingerprint stain on a latex uh, glove that had been involved in his case. Uh, he alleges the DNA analyst erroneously testified the fingerprint stain area of the glove was tested for, for blood when in fact it was not tested by the serologist. Uh, staff, as they always do, was very thorough in, in retrieving the transcripts and reviewing the matter. They determined the serologist actually testified that the latex glove uh, with the latent print impression was subjected to presumptive testing for blood on several locations and all proved to be positive. Uh, they also testified they did not conduct a presumptive test on the fingerprint uh, stain itself, but also nine other areas of the glove. The analyst also testified that she swabbed the fingerprint stain and the DNA profile obtained from the fingerprint stain was a mixture of the victim and defendant, uh, could not be excluded as contributors. Uh, quite frankly, the, the allegation did not, uh, did not square up with the complaint in, in almost any respect. Uh, staff's preliminary rec recommendation to us was to dismiss the complaint because the allegations are inconsistent with the actual record. I'm prepared to make that in the form of a motion unless there are any questions or comments. So I'll make a motion to dismiss. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, our next complaint is item 22.21, comes from Andre Webb. Uh, complaining against the Austin Police Department Forensic Science Bureau. Uh, his claim is that the police fabricated uh, his DNA on the robbery victim's shirt because the police executed a search warrant for his DNA without his attorney present, which is not really a problem. Uh, the staff did their usual thorough job in reviewing this. They determined that uh, in the case, the police had reviewed some surveillance video in a robbery matter and determined that one of the suspects had actually grabbed the victim by the shoulder and the crime scene specialist swabbed the victim's shirt in that area for possible DNA. Uh, Signature Science tested it and reported a partial DNA profile and also a mixed, turned out to be a mixture of three particular individuals. Um, there really wasn't sufficient supporting data or witness confirmation to support the complaint. 
uh, staff uh, following their customary thorough work on it had made a recommendation to us preliminarily to dismiss the complaint because the allegations of false or planted evidence uh, simply were not supported or were insufficient to warrant uh, commencing an investigation and having reviewed it and the supporting materials I'm prepared to make that in the form of a motion <coughs> any further comments is there a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Okay. Opposed? Carries. Which brings us to our next uh, complaint matter. It's made by Daniel St. Clair uh, against the Fort Worth Police Department Crime Laboratory. Uh, he is uh, acting as a case agent uh, with the federal firearms cases. He has alleged there's an unauthorized disassembly of a reported machine gun by the technician Alan Klingon in a case involving a defendant named Handy. Uh, the complaint alleges the disassembly of the weapon was not really authorized by the case agent or the detective or even by the laboratory procedures. And I think Robert Smith has received some additional information just this last week that would help clarify this and bring us to uh, appropriate action. Uh, yes, sir. After the complaint, he also sent a series of emails. Uh, Mr. St. Clair did. Uh, Robert, can you get closer to the mic? I'm sorry. Uh, after the complaint, he sent us a series of emails uh, which alleged that uh, this was disassembled out of curiosity uh, and that he was subsequently removed from the federal task force for making this complaint. Uh, he makes a lot of allegations uh, that the defendant, Handy, uh, was convicted in state court without full discovery of all these issues and that the federal case was rejected because uh, the lab would not supply him, the agent, with a copy of their SOP. He requested one uh, later under the Freedom of Information Act and received it. Um, so the laboratory response is um, that this weapon, it's an AR-15, uh, was submitted with an aftermarket device. It's called various things, an auto sear, or a 3D printed Swift link, which is just a small device. If you open the weapon and insert it, it converts it to fully automatic. Uh, and because that was there, it failed their initial f safety inspection, was disassembled to take that piece out, photographed it, sent it to the case agent, uh, St. Clair, uh, documenting that it had this device in it. Um, so subsequently, Fort Worth PD did a lot of investigation on this. They got a uh, statement from the resident agent in charge of that federal task force saying that this SOP is not required for federal prosecution. This case was not rejected because of the failure to provide that SOP. Um, and on the question of discovery, there's really no evidence to support it at this time. Um, the police chief over the lab, had meetings with the ADA, uh, excuse me, the uh, DA's office in Fort Worth specifically discussing this case and these issues. Uh, everything the commission has received, we forwarded to that same uh, prosecutor. Um, so I'm not, there's really no support that we know of in the record that uh, discovery wasn't provided on this issue about taking this device out of the gun before the NIBA test fire. And I would also say we looked at OSAC registry standards and there is a safety, safe handling of firearm standards and of course the safety of the people handling the firearm when it comes into the laboratory. These firearms are not always in the best condition and so they need to take what steps they need to take in order to ensure that they are able to handle the weapon safely. And, it, and what was done here appears to be in line with the principles that are laid out in that standard. Uh, specifically, I'm just chiming in there. <clears throat> it's an OSEC uh, registry recommendation for the safe handling of firearms adopted in 2020. It says it, the firearms should be inspected for defects, modification, and missing or broken parts prior to test firing. Um, so the SMP at didn't specifically authorize him to do this, but it didn't prohibit him either. That SOP has been revised. Uh, 
y'all remember we've been working with them on their NIBIN processes and they're making revisions and to their documentation uh, and it's all being um, updated with the uh, national accrediting body um, and so for that reason we are recommended that mm -hmm. we dismiss this complaint as not supported by the record and the little device that's in that AR-15 that turns it fully automatic would obviously be an aftermarket modification that falls within the list that Robert just quoted you from the OSAC registry standard. That's how I perceive it. Well, in light of that information uh, and the other work the staff has done in connection to this matter and uh, the allegations and the lack of facts supporting it, I would make a motion to dismiss this complaint. No further comments. We've had a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Complaints dismissed. Which brings us to uh, complaint number 22.30. Uh, it's made uh, by Mark Thiessen, uh, I guess, Department of Public Safety. Uh, Mark's a very fine lawyer in Houston. It alleges a blood alcohol analyst, Tiffany Parker, who now is serving as a uh, section supervisor, had switched some samples in at least two cases, uh, HOU 2009-12731 and 12783. The complaint alleges that in a batch analyzed uh, almost two years ago, in October 20, that three cases uh, had failed the 5% acceptance window. Uh, staff had done some work on this, but also referred this to Dr. Kerrigan, who's with us remotely. And I think it might be appropriate we let her uh, share with, her, with us her review. Dr. Kerrigan? I can, I will tell you before we turn it over to Dr. Kerrigan what we received. Um, so the three failed samples were contained in a batch that was um, analyzed on October 8th of 2020. And the samples that initially failed the agreement requirement were identified by DPS Houston at the time and marked as failed on the batch list. And the Shimatsu instrument prints out. In fact, just this morning we got a copy of what this looks like, but it's quite clear in the case record when there's a failure. Um, and DPS supplied us with evidence that the samples that initially failed to meet the 5% acceptance criteria were rerun pursuant to the laboratory's SOP. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, that batch was executed on October 12th. The second run produced results within the 5% acceptance window and pursuant to the SOP, the new set of data was used for reporting and the chromatograms were retained in the case records. So the lab did what it was supposed to do when this type of event occurs. I don't think Dr. Kerrigan, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, saw anything in those data that would suggest that the explanation of switch sample is the um, likely explanation. But Dr. Kerrigan, did you want to weigh in? Um, correct, Lynn. Um, absolutely. I mean, the, the batch lists that were provided by DPS in response to this confirmed that DPS followed their SOP. Um, they reran the samples. They also provided copies of the final reports that were issued in those three cases that reflect that the final reports were issued on the retest results, not the original results. And so this complaint wouldn't even rise to the level of a self-disclosure because essentially the lab just followed its SOP. Um, so I would certainly be in favor of dismissing it. Anything else, Dr. Kerrigan? Sounds like no. Um, in light of the information provided, I would at this time make a motion to dismiss this complaint. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, our last complaint is item 22.34. It's brought by Shakivia Ivory on behalf of uh, defendant Adrian Gaston. 
against Houston Forensic Science uh, Center, the allegation or complaint is that there were uh, DNA mixture results obtained of the victim's fingernail scrapings uh, that were introduced to his trial and used to convict him. And they determined that there had not previously been any DNA mixture review. Staff had made an appropriate recommendation that we might refer this to the statewide DNA mixture review project and Bob Wyckoff. That sounds logical to me. And if there aren't any questions or comments, I would make that in the form of a motion that we refer this to the uh, statewide DNA mixture review project. I do have a couple quick comments. Um, the HFSC and uh, Mr. Wyckoff's team are already working together on this, I'm understanding. Correct. Yes, so they're already on it. Um, I would also like to give a shout out to Bob Wyckoff because he has agreed to triage all the cases coming from the Cologne matter that we took up last time, which is probably 800 DPS cases plus another 1,400 HFSC cases. And that is a big task. And Bob has agreed to do that. And I know the labs are grateful for that because it helps them take the information that's out there within the system that they don't necessarily have access to and prioritize what needs to be addressed. So we're really grateful to Bob Wyckoff and his boss at the Harris County Public Defender for allowing him to take that task on. Motion, do you say? Is there a uh, second to the motion on the floor? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And Dr. Bernard, before we leave the complaints disclosures, uh, Staff had dismissed uh, four complaints. They actually have the authority to do that under certain circumstances we gave them two and a half, three years ago. Uh, but I think it's always good to summarize those. It's uh, complaint number 22.26 by Peter Dolan against Herman Hospital regarding sexual assault to kid. 22.27, uh, Gerald Durden against Harris County Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, case number 22.28, Jordan Benson. Uh, made against EPS Garland. In case number 22.31 by Christopher Wembley against uh, District Attorney Henry Garza concerning I eyewitness ID and staff had dismissed those. I reviewed the basis on which they did it. I would make a motion this time. We just simply give approval of that to make sure we do good housekeeping. We've had a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. And that would conclude our complaints disclosure, Dr. Burr. Uh, opposed? All right, motion carries. All right. So the next uh, discussion topic is the status of the Crime Laboratory Accreditation Program. Um, I'll give a summary of accreditation-related events this quarter. Staff has evaluated seven accreditation-related events. One was related to a proficiency test anomaly from the proficiency test provider FTS, um, where uh, the materials trace examiner came up with an uh, unexpected conclusion. And that was because the sample had an unusually large number of lead containing particles that would have taken 175 hours to analyze. So the, of course, the trace examiner, examiner got the answer wrong, but it was because of the sample, and they just simply corresponded with FTS, and um, FTS offered to send them a new sample and redo the test. But the laboratory reported that um, in compliance with their obligation to share communications with us that they have with their, they also reported it to the ANAB as well. We had three renewals of accreditation, um, one extension of scope and accreditation by Fort Worth PD. They do quantitation of drugs now, um, and then one accreditation probation by CAP against the laboratory expert talks. And just to be clear, under a probation by CAP, um, the laboratory can still perform accredited testing. Probation just means that they're uh, under an obligation to fulfill a certain list of items that are included in that letter that's included in your meeting materials. 
And you'll also see that the commission followed exactly what CAP did, because if CAP withdraws the accreditation, the commission in turn will withdraw the accreditation. And the same thing with probating accreditation. Since CAP probated the accreditation, we also have to probate the accreditation for the laboratory. And so they are on probation if you look at our website right now, but they're still permitted to perform accredited forensic testing at this point, technically. And we'll address this in a separate yeah, we'll matter on the agenda. And then the final incident was just an incident of lost drug evidence, and, and the laboratory did a thorough root cause analysis and attributed no fault to employees and believes the drug evidence was lost in transit. That's it for that one, Lynn. Did you want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Um, does anybody have questions about the accreditation memo? Okay. Um, the next item under this agenda number five is the removal of CAP and SAMHSA as recognized accrediting bodies for the purpose of the work that we do here at the commission. Now this is something that's been on our agenda intermittently for a number of years now actually. Um, you might recall, well, I'm, I don't know that any of you were here uh, well, actually, a number of you were. Uh, Dr. Kerrigan, I know, will remember this, but the accreditation program that we now have jurisdiction for used to sit at DPS. DPS was the accreditation authority, and there came a certain point where the legislature decided that that didn't really make sense because DPS has, you know, an entire laboratory system. So it was serving this dual role as the oversight body for accreditation while it was an accredited entity itself. And so DPS um, shifted their responsibilities and their data over to us when the legislature assigned us that responsibility. And we adopted the DPS rules wholesale at that time, just shifted them over. And then over time, we've been amending them to suit the needs of the laboratories or our processes. One of the things that we inherited from DPS was the fact that they recognized CAP and SAMHSA as accrediting bodies. and. When we talked to Pat Johnson, when he was a member of the commission, uh, one of the things that he said to us was that when they first set up the accreditation uh, program, which was way back in 2005, they didn't really evaluate the accrediting bodies. Um, what they were doing was setting it up in such a way to help facilitate the transition to the 38.35 admissibility requirement for forensic testing. And so at the time, some labs that are CAP accredited would by happenstance end up having to testify in criminal cases. And so the issue of accreditation was coming up in those circumstances and because of that, um, they just included CAP and SAMHSA more for convenience, really, than anything. I mean, SAMHSA is not even an accrediting body. It's not an AB. Um, and so over the years, what we've found is that the vast majority of the labs that are doing casework and criminal courts in Texas are accredited under ANAB 17025 and AR 3125 or A2LA's program, which is similar, um, though not the same, but similar. And CAP's forensic drug testing program, what we found in the process of working through the Expertox complaint is that it's far less uh, rigorous than what we see when ANAB uh, comes in. We have, the, their entire process is confidential we checked in many, many, many times with them to try to find out the status of the investigation with Expertox, and they won't share 
documents with us. Um, eventually, Expert Talks gave us their probation, their accreditation probation, but it was delayed. Um, and they're just, when we reached out to the CAP labs themselves, if you recall, Dr. Kerrigan suggested that we do that. And so last, between the last meeting and now, we let the labs know that this was gonna be on the agenda. And the truth is the CAP labs primarily are doing work in the clinical environment or in another environment that's already exempt under 38.35. Um, and sometimes their work ends up in a criminal proceeding. But we have an exemption for the CLIA program, which most of them are testing under if this stuff ends up in a criminal case anyway. That's already a rule made exemption that we did at the request of Redwood Toxicology when the licensing requirements came up. So in terms of impact on the labs, we're not hearing that this is going to have a major impact on the core work that they already do. But we feel pretty strongly, having observed what we have, that the programs that A and ANAB, I mean, and A2LA administer are fundamentally different than what CAP is there for, or certainly SAMHSA. So um, we just think this legacy issue, it's time to address it. And so we have a proposed rulemaking before you to remove those two bodies uh, from the list of recognized accrediting bodies. And then those labs that meet the exception can rely on the exception for CLIA activities. Dr. Kerrigan, did you want to add anything? No, I think you've covered everything perfectly. Thanks, Lynn. Any further discussion? Okay. So we need to have a motion made to remove, uh, to draft a rule to remove CAP and SAMHSA from the uh, recognized, recognized accrediting bodies. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion carries. Okay. So the next item in this number five is to talk about a very exciting development. Would you like to hear all about it? I've, I'm thrilled, thrilled to announce this to you guys. We, so, need, we need some excitement. It's so exciting to me. So, you all may remember that over the years, um, so the way the this, this statute governing the commission's work is written, we have, and the way historically it's worked is that we have this sort of supplemental auditing authority. But because we're small and limited in scope, the main assessment always of the labs happens by the ABs, A and AB and A2LA primarily. And Sometimes if particular issues are raised to us, we'll go in and do a deeper dive. And sometimes that creates a bit of a tension, frankly, between us and A and AB in particular, because we're pointing out things that perhaps they missed. Um, now, sometimes they miss them because it's not within the scope of what they do. Sometimes they miss them because their on-site assessments are only so long, and if they get focused on a particular issue, they may not see these issues. But it's created historically, I mean, we work well with them, but a little bit of tension, I think. Um, and so we received some outreach recently from ANAB, which I was thrilled about, where they said, you know, they had, one of their lead um, people in the organization had started reading our reports that we've written. And, and he started thinking through the question of, well, look, the accreditation standards already require the laboratories to be in compliance with any governing bodies that are applicable, oversight bodies. So the commission is certainly one of those. And so the question that they had was, 
well, we're looking at these recommendations in your reports, and these are really good reports, and so how can we help facilitate that the laboratories are considering the recommendations that may be universally applicable and applying those um, to their operations? Is that something you would like or you are expecting us to do? Because we're not doing it right now. You know, it, what is your expectation, Forensic Science Commission? And so as we, as we started talking, the idea came up, because in Maryland, they have something called a Maryland checklist for all the assessments, where the Maryland State Authority has some additional things that get tacked on to their assessments. And so the suggestion was made to do essentially a Texas checklist, which would cover certain areas. So number one, this has been a really stubborn issue for a and B and TFSC, we don't always both get copied on everything. So sometimes stuff goes to the AB that we don't get or things come to us that, the, that they don't get. And then later on when we're talking with them, it's like, well, you know about that issue involving the blah, blah at X lab. And they're like, no, what do you mean? We didn't get copied on the issue involving blah, blah at X lab. So the first thing is to make sure that correspondence is going to both places so there's open flow of communication. That would be one checklist item. The rest of the items on there have to do with the laboratories considering our recommendations and having made an assessment of whether they're applicable, even though the report itself does is not their issue. In other words, it's not their disclosure. It's not their complaint. It's their neighbors, but have they thought about the extent to which the items recommended in this report that applies to another lab affects their operations? Now, having talked with the labs, I think they do this informally already to, to quite a great degree, actually. I think they pay very close attention. Our quality folks are always here. If they're not physically here, they're online watching. So they pay close attention, but this would formalize that process. Now, I presented this to the TACLID yesterday, and they said, I mean, I think there was general support for it. There's the question of, okay, what is the checklist gonna look like? What, you know, what ANAB typically requires is um, evidentiary support. So what will that look like, you know, and I think, when we were speaking with ANAB, they said it, it could be a combination, perhaps, of interviews with documentary evidence. But the idea being that we will work with the, there's a statewide quality administrator, quality director group now, that we will work closely with them on trying to figure out what makes the most sense for the labs. Um, Tarrant County ME made a great suggestion yesterday, which is that if we're gonna do this, it would be helpful for them if we consolidate the universally applicable recommendations into a single document so that they can sort of keep track of it more easily rather than having to refer to disparate reports. So that is one thing we can do to help them. Um, and I just, you know, I really feel like it's a risk assessment uh, issue for the labs that from what I'm hearing, I mean, I just think that the potential for us working collaboratively with ANAB on this is just phenomenal. It just, I, it just brings me so much joy to be presenting this to you all because I think it really forges a new path forward for the ANAB TFSC relationship. And then we can also do outreach to A2LA as well to bring them into the fold. So that's my, my perspective on this item. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I, I think that um, you know this is a, a good thing that they're recognizing it. It's a little uh, disappointing though that the rest of the country probably doesn't have the same sort of communication. Most of them don't have a commission, so I would imagine that their inspections are maybe at a lower level of expectation. Yeah. So. So, I mean, I'm in favor of this, but how does this address where the gap, sorry, where the gap is in the process? Because many of the things that we've seen 
is either one, it's not their responsibility, or they missed it, or they were misled in some of the um, assessments of laboratories. So, and they seem to be really on the methodology, the interpretation, and that seems to be a big gap. Is this, do you foresee this as a way to make that better or address that issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it could, because I think to the extent A and A B is limited by the fact that they're assessing to just the ISO standard, and sometimes they feel like some of these more core level issues go beyond that. But once the recommendations are incorporated into their process, then they are able to evaluate against those and work together with us on that. So I think, I don't know that it's going to immediately address it or directly address it, but it is one mechanism. Because if we say something that they didn't say, and the lab says, okay, we've looked at that recommendation, like hemp MJ, NMS did this whole really thorough review of how they were doing that because they were seeing some conversion. There's so much in that NMS report that is universally applicable. So much. I'm not saying that all the labs are experiencing what NMS did. I'm just saying that they should all be looking at what happened at M NMS and figuring out whether that any of those things are an issue for their own internal hemp MJ differentiation method. So by incorporating that into the that expectation into the accreditation process, I think it's it's potentially a way to bring in some of the things that ANAB has not historically covered in their assessments and make it a part of their process. I don't I can't predict exactly how it's going to work, but I think it's a step in the right direction. All right, any further discussion? Uh, do I have a motion uh, to direct the commission to collaborate with ANAB staff to develop key recommendations for the, uh, uh, from the commission reports to the uh, laboratories? So moved. Move. Second, then. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, next is item number six, <coughs> which is a uh, discussion of the advisory uh, committee updates. Um, right now we have a total of uh, 1,374 licensees. And before the end of the year, we will renew 1,054 of those licenses. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in the next few months. The bulk of those are gonna be renewals. I think there's 400 of those in November and another 300 in December. So Rodney and I and the rest of the staff will be really busy towards the end of the year uh, working on those renewals. Um, the next thing we need to do is consider reappointing four of our licensing board members. They all have expressed an interest to be reappointed and they're all el eligible for another two year term. The, the um, candidates that are expiring are Angelica <laughs> Cogliano, um, who is a defense lawyer, representative of uh, the defense bar, Callie Bailey, who's a, the prosecutor's representative, and Sandy Parent, and Deborah Smith, who are both forensic scientists. And we've been grateful to have them on the committee. They've done a good job. Angela's uh, new. We just appointed her to fill Bill Hines' seat, if you recall. All right. Um, do I have a motion to reappoint the members, the four members that are currently on the commission that are up for reappointment? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Okay, I think the next item here are these two rules. Both of these rules address the same three concepts, just in different sections of the rules. One's the renewal section, 651-208, and the other's the voluntary section. And the three things that we're saying here is that you gotta be doing independent or supervised casework. You gotta be signed off to do casework to be licensed. 
a certain amount of casework. And what we say is actively doing casework. So it's still up to the laboratory to determine what it is. Because we can't say a specific number of cases you have to be doing to get a license. Um, and A and AB does not say it, and the ISO standards don't say it. I don't know if you want to say anything else about So we talked at some length yesterday in the meeting about whether the commission should establish a minimum number of cases because in that lengthy call that we had with ANAB, they mentioned that they don't say specifically how many because there's so much diversity from discipline to discipline. And that, that sort of reality came shining through in the LAC meeting yesterday. Um, it just depends on the volume of cases that the lab gets. It depends on the discipline. Obviously, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to do active casework and seize drugs than in some areas of trace, for example, where you may not get a request for a really long time. And so the point of this is just that we don't want people maintaining licensure just to have the credential. They need to be engaged in active casework, whatever that means, per the accrediting body in that particular discipline. If later on we feel like we need to come up with a minimum number of cases, we can revisit the issue. But for right now, we didn't think that it was something that could be established across the board, given the variability in the disciplines. Yeah, I think really we're just trying to prevent, you know, some, someone who's 10 years out of practice, we don't want them to have a license and go out and be able to represent themselves. But if they're not doing casework, they're probably also not testifying. Someone made that point yesterday, too. So. And these are mostly people who've promoted to management, but for whatever reason wanted to hold the credential. Um, I think in most labs, there's sort of an organic or natural process that when people promote, they let sort of let go of some of that. Um, it just sort of depends on the size of the lab. The second thing we address in these rules is we clarify on our proficiency testing form um, that some of these positions and job duties do not require specifically proficiency testing. They require, some of them require under ISO standards intra-laboratory or inter-laboratory comparison exercises. And so we just add that language in here to make it clear to supervisors that are signing this form that those count as well. They don't have to be proficiency tested because we get that question a lot. And so we wanted to clarify on the form that that is really what we're looking for, that they don't have to be specifically <laughs> proficiency tested already um, in order to be licensed. And that's an accrediting body issue that was pointed out to us by a &AB that our PT form could be a little bit confusing because some people, in order to fulfill what has historically been the PT requirement, they do inner lab or intra lab testing that is sometimes more robust, actually, frankly, than the external PT is. Um, but that fulfills the accrediting body requirement, so we want to make sure we're clear because it was causing some confusion. Some people do external PT. Sometimes it's done, but just not all the time. And that was an accrediting rule that was changed fairly recently. This is 208, correct? Yeah, so all of these changes are applicable to both. Okay. Everything I'm talking about is applicable to both. So the third thing that's addressed in both are that um, the manager needs to designate the specific discipline that applies to the person's job duties. So one example would be we've had people that qualify to be a forensic biology DNA analyst, for example. So there was confusion around whether they should go ahead and get the forensic biology DNA analyst license. And a lot of people did that because they didn't want to have the stats requirement that was going to take effect after the grandfathering rule went away. Um, but now we just want to make it clear that people should have a license that complies ex or that matches exactly what their job duties are. So if you're doing screening work, you should have a screening analyst license. And once you graduate to the DNA analyst position, then you have the forensic biology DNA analyst license. 
And so we make that clear both on the PT form and in the rules with some language there. Um, and then the last two things are just very minor. We just, we just um, make it clear that you have an ongoing obligation to, pro to provide updated address information so that we can notify you if, of an investigation of any finding against your license or any disciplinary action against you so that you can receive proper notice. And that's it. And I also made these changes to the regular license rules too. They're just not in here. And yesterday we made, the licensing board made a couple really great edits that I was able to make to the first 651.208 this morning, but I didn't have time to do it to the other one. So Govinda has a clean version of 208, but not the second one. But if, when we vote on these, if we could vote just with the changes that um, the licensing board mentioned yesterday, that do you need two motions or do you or can you make one that includes both one is fine okay i think i think you should do two yeah okay Susan. all right do i have a uh, is there any further discussion sorry all right do i have a motion to amend 651.208 regarding the comments just made and at the meeting yesterday for Monitoring, testing, and proficiency requirements for continued licensure. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Is there a second motion to draft the a similar rule to 651.222 uh, for voluntary licensees? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Sorry. All right, motion carries. So we're to the update on the pilot examination. On the pilot exam, so we administered five different sessions. I did an in-person session. So everybody took it using the remote software that we've contracted through Sam Houston State University. But we just did it with our computers in person at the TDIAI conference June 9th. Big time. So we ran into all the technical issues the first time that we did it, which was helpful for the next three sessions, um, but discouraging a little bit because a lot of people ha are using laptops issued by government agencies that have firewall after firewall, and they need their tech person there to let them in to, to run any new software program and especially one that's going to close out every program on your computer and that's what Respondus does. So we had issues with that but um, we had about 20 people take it at TDIAI and then we had uh, four additional sessions in the next four to five weeks. I think we skipped the week of 4th of July. Um, but we had a total of 95 candidates take the test so we got a good subset of data. And our psychometricians um, provided us with a report that analyzes the performance of the tests, not necessarily the candidates. And so each category of the seven domains that we've tested performed about where we would expect them. So if you look at the chart that's in your materials, there's a page. This is probably the most helpful page, or that I thought was the most helpful page, where they measure um, it's the PPV value, and that is, and so the first one, evidence handling, it says 0 .70. That means 70% of the people did well, that you would expect to do well, did well in that evidence handling section. And based on what they tell us, that is what you want and what you expect. You want it to be about that level, and all of them are about at 70 or above. The next step, though, is to establish a cutoff score, and the way we do that is to um, establish a group of subject matter experts, which are just people that are able to determine what should be the minimum competency level for each of these topics. So we're going to have, I think, Robert, Lynn, um, maybe somebody else from our staff and three other licensing committee members 
who will work with ACS Ventures, our psychometricians, to um, they'll evaluate each question, determine which ones are going to be thrown out, which ones we should keep, and then they'll establish a cutoff score, and we'll finally be able to get these people their score and let them know if they passed or not. And then from there, we'll be able to implement the new test. And then if you all recall, we decided to, um, for this round of the test, and they're going to help us do this too, we decided to have an overall score, average of 70%, but a minimum number of questions right in each <coughs> section. We don't know what that number is, but it's going to be more than one. It's not going to be zero like it is now. So you can't, it's not a compensatory model anymore. I mean, there's, in some way you can compensate, because it may be one or two in one section and three in the other, but, but we're going to have them help us decide what it should be. And if you look at the um, stats, obviously st statistics is the least, is the most difficult, um, most difficult section on the test for everybody. And we have to keep in mind too that this was a totally different subset of people that took these different disciplines. These aren't people that, most of the people that took this are not subject to the mandatory licensing rules. These were people expecting to get a voluntary license. So these aren't our regular test takers that we got the data from. Um, does anybody have any questions about the data or anything else that we've evaluated here? We're going to go through the cut rate exercise the week after next. It's using a particular psychometric method called the Anghoff method, I think is the name of it. And it's designed to get us to the cut score. Anghoff. Anghoff. Or Inghoff. And this is all, you know, we defer to our consultants that help us with this. They're very good. Really good. The test was, I, mean, I would say it was generally hard, but we addressed one of the biggest complaints from the last test, which was reciting some of the material. Some of the questions were just, what did so and so say about a certain thing? Like, why do we care about so-and-so's opinion? We want you to understand how to interpret the concept. So we have a lot of scenario-based questions where you really have to understand what we're asking you. And that's hard to do if you haven't <coughs> taken a test in a long time. So the test, I would say, is more difficult than the one we currently have. But it also is be a better teaching. It's a better teaching tool than the one <coughs> That's just my take on it. Yeah, we were happy with the item analysis because it came out. I mean, statistics is the one place where people struggle, but that we sort of expect that. Is that Sorry, Patrick. They don't like it. <coughs> just struggle as a student as well. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Next is item number seven, which is the review and adopt of the final report regarding Expertox complaint. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is a draft investigative report for your consideration today. Uh, it's based on a complaint filed by the Philadelphia DA's office uh, regarding hair testing conducted here in, in Texas by Expertox <coughs> that was used in a criminal action in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, it also alleges there was an interpretive opinion issued by Dr. LaKissa, who operates Expertox. Uh, so I have a quick timeline of the investigation because it has been rather long. Um, it, the complaint was originally filed in January and we accepted it in, for investigation. Uh, in July of last year, we uh, retained a subject matter expert in forensic toxicology, Dr. Timothy Rorick, and uh, he issued a extensive report in December of 2021. We immediately sent that to CAP, the accrediting body, um, because of the concerning information that was contained in that uh, probation report. Um, CAP placed expert talks on probation, as we discussed in the accrediting section of this meeting, um, on May the 27th. and. Um, <clears throat> We were basically advised by CAP's lawyer to ask Expertox if they had any information about the investigation. 
uh, and we did, and Expert Talks then provided us a copy of the CAP probation letter. That's how we got it. Um, and then July the 17th, Dr. Lakissa was uh, interviewed by the investigative panel. Um, so just a summary of the uh, complaint, it involves a September 29 sexual assault allegation where the survivor reported uh, drugging was involved. Uh, during a search warrant, the police found a bottle of lidocaine. Uh, the complaint alleges that Expertox, through an intermediate collection agency in Philadelphia called ArcPoint, uh, was engaged to conduct this hair testing as part of the investigation, and they provided a lab report with hair test results and an interpretive report. And after those reports, the ADA in Philadelphia became concerned about the quality and reliability of that information based on some discussions with Dr. LaKissa uh, and referred it to the Conviction Integrity Unit uh, in Philadelphia. And then Carrie Wood, who was the head of the unit at that time, submitted this complaint to us. Uh, prior to that, they uh, engaged uh, NMS uh, expert Dr. Sherry Kachinko to review the re materials. And so uh, her draft report was attached as part of the complaint. Uh, she was strongly critical of um, the reports and statements made in those um, reports and made by Dr. Lakissa. Uh, so just informationally, the uh, request for testing uh, it's going to be hard for you to see, but up in the uh, top corner, uh, it indicates that this is a court order test. Uh, there's a checkbox up there. It's like, is this pre-employment or is this, you know, accident investigation? And court order is one of them. So they check that. Uh, it's asking them at the bottom right corner to conduct a date rape panel uh, test. And then it adds in the middle there a specific request to uh, test for lidocaine based on the facts of the case. Um, so that's what the testing re uh, request looked like. And then uh, Expert Talks issued a report October the 24th uh, indicating that they detected lidocaine uh, at 3.9 milligram, uh, picograms per milligram. Uh, they detected THC at 7.5 picograms. Um, and it, in that report, it has a caveat um, that says, if you go to the next slide, you can see it, uh, for clinical use only. Uh, it's like the third line for the bottom. Clinical use only, not for forensic purposes. So that's the official original report issued by Expert Talks. Um, and then the interpretive opinion uh, was issued in February uh, 24th, and it's kind of in a letter format, so I didn't include it for you, but basically uh, Dr. Lykissis, who signed this letter report, uh, indicated that these amounts of drugs uh, have the potential uh, for serious combined enhanced pharmacological effect on the mental and physical faculties of the victim, and if administer her without her consent could constitute a drug facilitated assault by the perpetrator. <clears throat> um, so that's the basis of the uh, complaint. Um, Dr. Lakissa was notified of this complaint on January the 12th and he appeared at the quarterly meeting um, in January of 2021 and indicated in an email that it was with great surprise that uh, he was being investigated because this report is clearly labeled for clinical use only. Um, and in this quarterly meeting, he told the commission that he told the prosecutor that he did not have a validated method for lidocaine and that the test was positive, but it was in a clinical method. And he claims that he told the uh, uh, prosecutor, I don't want to testify. I cannot offer you anything scientifically valid. Um, and he says he stressed the caveat to this prosecutor when he talked to him. And that conflicts very much with a uh, statement that we obtained from the ADA. And it's her recollection that Dr. Lakissa told her that the suspect uh, gave the victim a witch's brew 
and uh, that she got him with the results of these tests. And um, General Counsel Garcia talked to him about his interpretive report uh, and her concerns with that. And his statement about that is, as far as I'm concerned, this test should not have been used even though I wrote the report. Uh, and he claimed at that meeting that he was unaware that this was being used in connection with the criminal action. Um, right after the quarterly report, um, Dr. Kachinko, who watched the statements by Lakissa, notified the prosecutor with concerns about what he said and reminded her that there was a report in the file that did not contain that caveat. So we talked to the DA's office and they supplied us a copy of this forensically validated report. And it's the exact same report, except the caveat's been removed. All the dates are the same. It doesn't indicate it's an amendment or a supplement. Um, and through our discussions, we learned that that was provided to the DA's office for an additional fee. So in the way we learned about that, um, we talked to the prosecutor and she went to her supervisor uh, and needed authorization to purchase, the, purchase this forensically validated version of the report. Um, and you know, they paid the fee and then Expert Talks billed ArcPoint $1,315 for this forensically validated version of a reported drug facility, facilitated sexual assault. Um, so we have emails from the prosecutor uh, to Expert Talks um, in December of 2019 and in February of 2020 uh, directly to Dr. Lykissa. So at some point he's talking directly to the prosecutor in this case. So just to back up and kind of put this in context on the underlying criminal case, this was a Philadelphia police officer who was arrested for sexual assault in September of 2019. And at a bail hearing in October, the prosecutor announced to the court that there was hair analysis being conducted. Uh, November 1st of 2019, again in court, um, the prosecutor told the court that this test was positive for one, more than one drug that the victim did not voluntarily consume. Uh, and she announced her intention to increase the charges uh, to rape by the administration of drugs, which is a first degree felony, higher charge than what he originally was faced with. And at a January 2020 hearing, um, the prosecutor introduced uh, into evidence this forensic report, the second version, did not have a caveat on it. And she told uh, the court that she would certify in good faith that she would eventually have a doctor testify about the uh, relevance of this report and what these results mean. Um, so we ask additional uh, information from Expert Talks. We ask them in writing to supply us a report about the number of times that these types of reports are used in a criminal proceeding. Um, and basically, he indicated it's about five. Uh, we interviewed him the other day. He said it's just a handful of cases. Um, and in his response to our request, uh, he added some statements uh, that he declined to testify since this test was for clinical use. It directly contradicts this prosecutor's affidavit that she gave the commission. Uh, he says in there, Expert Talks does not have a forensically validated hair testing method and that he reluctantly provided this opinion on the combined effects of the drug and put in there, my wrong uh, decision, unquote. Uh, so we obtained this outside expert to look at all the data. Um, the outside expert, uh, Dr. Rorig, was not provided with the NMS report, so he didn't even know it existed when he evaluated this. Uh, he issued a very thorough and complete report in December of 2021. And his ultimate opinion is uh, the toxicology report should never have been issued and the interpretive report is not founded or 
supported by current scientific literature. Regarding the results of the uh, test for lidocaine specifically, which is the most concerning, uh, he found that they were operating on a, under, under an unapproved SOP and that when they conducted this test, they used a single point of calibration uh, and the SOP requires a five point calibration curve. Uh, he also pointed out that their SOP reporting criteria, uh, the cutoff is 100 picograms. And in this case, they issued a report where the results were 3.9 picograms. So it was issued in violation of their SOP criteria for cutoff, and uh, it should have been reported as negative according to their SOP. Uh, and again, this method is not validated as required by the CAP forensic drug testing program um, and other uh, guidelines like the uh, forensic toxicologist code of professional responsibility. Uh, regarding the interpretive opinion like Kissa issued, uh, Dr. Rourke found it was not scientifically valid. Uh, the THC uh, can have effect, but it's not day specific. Lidocaine is a local anesthetic. It has low bioavailability. Uh, an oral administration will have little or no effect on the central uh, system. And the literature does not provide any uh, valid, uh, clinically relevant uh, information about the synergistic effect of a THC and lidocaine combined. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also uh, got a SOP from Expertox regarding this forensic versus non-forensic report. Um, and their SOP provides that they uh, need a valid chain of custody, then they review all the documents, and a sample should be retested if it's all possible. Uh, Dr. Lakissa says this is just used as a disclaimer for establishing the validity for clinical practice only since it's not performed with forensic criteria. Um, so Dr. Rorg's opinion is the significant upcharge for the removal of this disclaimer uh, raises ethical concerns. We interviewed Dr. Lakissa sometime last week, uh, and he acknowledged that this lidocaine was reported despite being below their reporting threshold. He acknowledged that as a single point calibration in violation of their SOP um, and that, that a single point calibration is not a valid method for producing a quantitative result. Uh, we had long discussions about prior validation of the method. Uh, he has submitted some things to us, but to date has not supplied validation data uh, for testing lidocaine and hair that preceded the analysis of this case in Philadelphia. Uh, he gave us a couple of years of acquisition method reports, uh, little five-page reports uh, on the Agilent Mass Hunt software, basically establishes acquisition parameters, but it's not a validation study. After we talked to him, somebody in his lab sent us a lidocaine analysis and pharma samples SOP. It's not a validation study. <coughs> Uh, and then recently he produced some information that CAP had requested, which is uh, there is a 2022 validation study of lidocaine for hair, but of course that was conducted well after the analysis in this case. Um, he maintains that his original report included this clinical disclaimer because the request was not clearly forensic despite the fact that it was labeled court order and testing for date rape. Um, but it's clear that he removed that caveat uh, after discussions with the prosecutor. And so at that point, it was clearly for forensic purposes. Um, the same with the interpretive report. Um, and Dr. Lakissa was not licensed by the commission at the time of any of these reports. <clears throat> so the findings uh, contained in this draft. Um, note that a forensic analyst license is required as of January of 2019. Um, we have some staff uh, emails informing or documenting that Dr. Lakitsa was uh, informed of this requirement in 2018 
and reminded again in 2019 um, and basically violated state law when he acted as a forensic analyst without a license because under 3801 a person may not act or offer to act as a forensic analyst in the state of Texas unless they hold a forensic analyst license. Uh, our findings that we recommend is a finding of professional misconduct for failing to obtain a license uh, in his laboratory located in Texas. Um, another finding of professional misconduct by reporting these lidocaine results that were not based on any reliable validation work um, and a separate investigation cap had reminded them on a different analyte that you got to have validation work for this. Um, so he's aware that that's a requirement. Uh, the interpretive opinion reported by uh, Dr. Lykesa uh, is unsupported uh, by accepted scientific principles and literature and also can constitute professional misconduct in this context. We also uh, have a finding of professional misconduct when he produced a forensic version of a clinical result for the payment of additional fee. Um, there was no retesting done. There's no indication in that second report that it's an amended report or the other one ever existed. Um, his explanation for these upcharges is not supported by the record and it's detailed in the report. It also conflicts with some testimony he gave in another similar case in another state where he testified that uh, the forensic report, it's all about money. You pay uh, for forensic purposes, you get a forensic report. It's the same test. We just uh, change the format of the report. Uh, so our observation is the removal of this disclaimer created a misrepresentation that the findings uh, it implied the analysis was conducted pursuant to the CAP forensic drug testing program when it was in fact not. Uh, we have another uh, recommendation. Uh, we note that CAP has placed expertox on probation, uh, but that means they can still perform analytical work. Uh, we detail historical issues expertox has had with accreditation in the past, and it's our uh, recommendation based on uh, administrative rule uh, that we withdraw the accreditation of expert tox in forensic, uh, the discipline of forensic toxicology, and we make a recommendation that stakeholders should consider submitting any forensic analysis performed by expert tox for review and reanalysis, if possible, by an independent accredited lab. Uh, that's the summary of the uh, expert tox report. Is there any discussion? Um, I would just like to thank Dr. Rorig. I don't know that he's listening, but he did a very, very thorough job in analyzing the information that he was given, even though that information was quite limited and problematic in terms of its quality and completeness. Um, also, Dr. Kerrigan, of course, uh, and the panel members for digging into the substance of this. Um, you know, this, what's come to our attention since we started working on this is that there are a number of, of cases with very severe consequences in them, both in, in and outside of Texas, uh, where Expertox has been involved. And this lab has been on the commission's radar for a very long time. Actually, predating our taking over the accreditation, there was, um, a uh, rare sort of reprimand letter that DPS had even issued saying that they were not appropriately representing their accreditation status on their website. So this has been going on for a very, very long time. And um, the issues that Dr. Rorig cites are significant, both in terms of their professional responsibility implications and the actual, what is perhaps most disturbing is the quality or lack thereof of the forensic analysis in the laboratory. Dr. Kerrigan, um, I don't know if you had anything to add on it. No. All right, so I'm gonna break this into three votes. One, is there a motion to adopt the final report? So moved. Is there a second? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. I'd like a motion to that specifically list that uh, Dr. LaKissa committed professional misconduct. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And then a final motion for withdrawal of accreditation for Expertox Lab. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Well, I'm so glad you volunteered for that one. All right, the next issue is an update regarding uh, complaint 21.27, University of Colorado, the Innocence Project. So this is the complaint regarding uh, firearm and tool mark analysis. Um, the, what we have received since our last meeting is a very thorough memorandum on reporting of inconclusives that was done by David Kay and uh, his law clinic at Yale. So we're uh, appreciative of that and that will help us uh, consider these reporting issues. It's quite complex because, um, and very thoughtfully done. But the other thing we're waiting on, and I just uh, was in communication with Dr. John Butler at NIST, they are doing a foundational uh, scientific review, a literature review in firearms, and they're going to be publishing that soon. And since that will look at uh, a core group of literature that and studies that have been done post PCAST, well, perhaps some pre, but also post PCAST, there are about three dozen of them, I think, that they'll be focusing on, and it doesn't really make sense for us to reanalyze all of that work when that's being done. I'm not saying that we're necessarily going to agree with everything that NIST says, we may or may not, but that it doesn't, they've been working on that for a couple years, so it doesn't make sense to duplicate that effort. So when we have that work back from NIST, which I anticipate will be happening sometime before our next meeting, um, then we will be able to get to work on the report. Yes. You mentioned it, uh, Dr. Case, uh, uh, Dr. Case, um, ar uh, article or memorandum. What do you make of it? What do you think? Um, I thought, you know, I think it's very thoughtfully done. It's a little bit perhaps complex to think through how to get the information he's trying to communicate through to the jury. That's the part that I'm wondering how it would be done. So. You know, the idea that there's not a, a universal error rate, that is a tough thing that I think the firearms community has been struggling with for a really long time. Um, and I think he offers some good options about how one might handle that, um, but it's still a challenging subject overall. Because for those inconclusives, it's really a limitation of the test. In, in a lot of those inconclusives where we have ground truth as an exclusion versus an examiner making a mistake. So distinguishing those two is a very difficult, sometimes the mis examiners throw it into the inconclusive bucket because it's easier when they really did have sufficient criteria to exclude. But in those cases where they don't have that information and so the best call truly is inconclusive, but we know ground truth is exclude because we have the blinds, like what they did at HFSC. That's distinguishing those two categories is, is challenging. I think, I think David and the students do a good job of trying to get at how to do that. The question is, I mean, I'll be interested to hear what you all think about whether what he's suggesting is is viable given the limitations of the criminal justice system essentially does that make sense patrick yeah, that's very well. yeah. Yeah. can i can i add something that i think the ground truth is the issue in a lot of these because just because something came from a known source doesn't mean it may be interpretable especially with damaged or you know malformed evidence so it really comes down to what's the proper interpretation from that evidence, not necessarily a known source. And these things are, have been conflated 
And I think that causes some of the troubles in getting to what may be the, the actual performance of individuals. Yes, and the suggestion in the article is to... I'm, I'm sorry, Patrick, could you move the mic, sorry. Yes, and the suggestion in the article is to move forward uh, with uh, the use of likelihood ratios, and you mentioned uh, to do the ratio between true positive over uh, false positive, excluding uh, inconclusives, for the reason that uh, you have mentioned it. Um, I don't hide that philosophically, that's the way I would like to see. I used it to report in likelihood ratio in pain cases 20 years ago, when I used it to do case work. The problem I see, or the opportunity that I see, uh, is that uh, such an approach would uh, require uh, for the practitioner to completely change the mindset, uh, the mind, uh, the world view on uh, how to interpret uh, firearm evidence to mark evidence. There will be a lot of training, and uh, you know, it's not just to have uh, uh, tool mark examiners to switch from the regular microscope to tr uh, 3D topography, and you do training, and you will be successful. It's not like to train somebody to use a, a software. Um, it's really very fundamental as a change. It will take time. If we recommend something like that, I think uh, that uh, uh, we should also come up with a plan to help uh, the transition, and I don't see that to happen uh, very uh, smoothly and uh, very soon, even though I would be extremely encouraging and uh, even willing to help uh, um, the way I yeah, can. I figured you would I, like I it. I want to make the yeah. point that uh, the recommendation in that article, uh, it will be uh, a very difficult transition should we as a commission adopt that. Mm -hmm. I figured, uh, Dr. Bussini, that you would like the recommendation because it is in line with previous conversations. And I don't know if that, that's the way other countries report out firearms evidence. I'm not sure if that's true or not. but. I mean, certainly the forensic analysts in DNA have sh made that shift. I don't know that it's an easy one, um, I think, and they have more statistics exposure. Yeah. So we would, I mean, the, this would absolutely um, dissolve the idea that, that statistics and firearms analysis that statistics is not relevant to firearms because it would absolutely be very much relevant to firearms in that case. Yeah, and uh, with uh, the current research uh, that has been going on uh, in the last years uh, on the using 3D topography of uh, firearm evidence so that you can objectively collect data, there are definitely much more opportunity than uh, there were used to be. You mentioned the DNA. I think if you went uh, to um, in the last 10, 15 years or something so, and uh, both of you can confirm to a conference like the Academy that the debate was uh, should we use likelihood ratio or should we use a CPI, CPE? And that has been a conversation that has been on for a certain time. And after that, the likelihood ratio prevailed. And then uh, the next uh, couple of years of conference was which software should we use? Right? And uh, they got there. So at least for firearms, uh, there is not a debate uh, CPI versus uh, uh, CPE because uh, you go from three possible conclusion, conclusion a deterministic black and white uh, with uh, anything that is gray is in the middle and so it's called it inconclusive into uh, what is suggested in uh, David Kay's paper into, uh, yes, a little white, a little black, and then uh, an infinite possibility of gray shades in the middle. Right. So it's why I mean it's a huge change where uh, you deal with uncertainty in a, in a case like that. Yes, I, um, I think it would be a big shift. Well, and I, I think, think it's going to be a huge shift because you're going to have to have people that uh, are willing to accept a change and there are going to be at least a generation of examiners who are going to be, it's going to be hard to move them that yeah. way. And the complex scientifically one. We will increase the size. The what? It will be a change that is really going to be complex, but scientifically one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also think the legal community may be resistant to change because all the past cases have been interpreted in one way. And now you're saying there's a alternate, maybe better, or even one that may correct for problems of the past opens up a whole avenue. And we saw even with bite marks, there are still, you know, um, you know, uh, government, uh, let's say DA's offices <coughs> that are advocating for bite marks for whatever the reasons are. So it may not just be a science shift that needs to occur. 
But not very many in Texas, though. That's, yeah. You're not talking about Texas. No, the not bite Texas. Mark thing. Okay, just being to be no, clear. No, no, no. Just to be clear. Uh, other parts. Jarvis is giving you the side eye right now. Yeah, not tech, <laughs> not Texas. Um, <laughs> not not at least in one county. <laughs> no, but um, but but that there are a lot of different pockets that it's going to take a while to make any shift. But it should be done. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? All right. We uh, don't need a motion on that. So the next item is an update on the investigative panel for uh, Brazoria County Crime Laboratory and Toxicology. So the main update here is that we are talking about bringing in an outside expert to help us through that. Um, I think the lab director is working really hard to get the SOPs in place and to get things up and running, but they're outsourcing everything right now. So it's definitely been an uphill uh, effort for the folks in Brazoria. Um, we will continue to work with them and the accrediting body. Did, did our previous vote on the budget cover the contract with the expert? Yes. Okay. So we don't need a motion on that. Any further discussion? All right. The next item is the update on, from the investigative panel for um, Complaint 22.16 for Joseph, Joseph Webster, Leighton Prince. Um, so we have been talking extensively with Ron Smith and Associates. They have provided us what they looked at. Um, the interesting thing about this is Ron Smith and Associates maintains that there's no way that a qualified analyst would have reached a different conclusion than what they reached, which was an association to Webster. And Henry Swafford, in his written uh, communications statement, basically says the exact opposite. So we have two of probably the most well-known and respected individuals or representatives in this area in Friction Ridge <coughs> saying very different things. So we have the information from Ron Smith and we will be talking with Henry Swafford. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> we were supposed to have talked with him, but then I got COVID, so we had to put it off, but we will talk with him soon. <coughs> Sorry. All right. Um. Uh, item number 11, oh, no motions needed for that. Uh, update for the self-disclosure of the Houston Forensic Science Center, uh, the biology DNA section. Okay, so um, on this one, we thought we were gonna have a report ready for this time. We have it drafted, but DPS needs to do some more work on the self-disclosure they gave us because they had an affidavit by the TL in this case that in some respects contradicts the quality uh, investigation that was done, or at least we feel like it, it does. And so we asked DPS to go back and take another look at it, and they're doing that now. We don't have their reevaluation yet, but I expect we'll have it between now and the next meeting, and I expect we'll have a report for you in October. Okay. Um, next item would be uh, an update regarding expiration of appeals period for 21.49 Fort Worth PD report. <coughs> Lee? Which one? Sorry. 12 uh, Fort Worth PD report appeals. On that one, um, we sent notice to Andrea Morrison <coughs> um, May 2nd, and she received it on May 4th. So the period um, for her to appeal expired June 4th. And so we just want to document on the record that we sent her notice um, and that we'll, we've published the report. So we don't need a motion on that. All right, uh, next is uh, the discussion of the current forensic development training and education pro uh, projects. So uh, one of the main things that we've been working on is, uh, you know, Lee is the jurisprudence chair for the academy meeting this year. So trying to get 
everybody to think about abstracts to submit their due August 1st. So we've talked to some of you about that already. Um, and then other than that, the DNA training that we were going, wanting to do with Bear County has been uh, sort of stalled. And so our hope is that once we have our training coordinator on board, he will be able to help push some of these projects forward that tend to take back seat. Um, I am giving a talk at uh, a conference coming up here in Austin that's a TCDLA innocence conference. Um, Chris Fabricant will be here because he wrote that book on the bite mark cases and Stephen Cheney's case is in there, so we'll talk about that. Um, we do need to do the training for the forensic DNA analysts on exclusions. And so that's another high priority for the person who comes in is to facilitate moving that forward. So those are our big things. Richard Alpert, who I'm sure a lot of you remember, um, he is currently doing, in, he's in the planning stages of a big um, forensic science education for law students at Baylor and has asked, has reached out to Judge Hervey, to myself, to a number of people, to Don Boswell, um, for help in developing that curriculum. So it's, there's a possibility that if we have subject matter areas that are applicable to y'all that we may reach out for help there. I think Richard wants to make it a really good course. And Baylor, um, uh, Judge Hervey has really been uh, talking with a lot of the deans of law schools about the need for this type of training. So Baylor seems to be very much um, on board and so we'll see how that goes. Hopefully it goes well. And uh, Baylor sort of prides itself on having graduates who are like ready to practice. Um, that's one of their advertising points. So I think this is an effort in that direction. And if you all don't, I mean, I know you all know Richard. He was a member of this commission. He was a prosecutor in Tarrant County for many years. Uh, DUI was his focus. DWI, DWI, sorry, mm -hmm. DWI. Any further discussion? All right, an update from uh, the uh, Texas Associate of Crime Lab Directors. <coughs> Thanks, we met yesterday. Uh, we voted in three new members. That brings us to 56 regular members. We've got 18 um, voting members in the organization. Had a good discussion with Lynn about uh, the ANAB checklist um, and some other database thoughts that are out there and how maybe we can do better at um, meeting Brady and Michael Morton requirements in the state. And then uh, probably the one thing that we voted on was after many years of discussion about this, actually uh, listing the organization as an unincorporated not-for-profit association so that we are more than just 12 nerds sitting around in a room um, and start working on a website and some things like that in anticipation of heading to the legislative session um, here upcoming. So any questions? Yeah, I think it'll be 12 nerds in a room. <laughs> So I did want to say one thing before you all go, which is one of the major initiatives that we're talking about with TACLID is a lab portal. Because um, right now, the way it works is that lab reports are issued, but the case records are not always pushed out with those lab reports unless they're requested through discovery. And then, of course, they are. But what we're seeing in various judicial proceedings from simple DWI all the way through to capital murders is that after the fact, the criminal justice system is having to reckon with the idea that perhaps there was some exculpatory impeachment or mitigating information sitting in those case records in the limbs at the labs. And so, the only really efficient way to get to make sure that information really truly makes it where it needs to go is to have a lab portal 
where authorized lawyers have act direct access to what's in those records. And so that is a major technology project that I think is going to be under discussion for the next legislative session because without that, everyone is reliant, or the defendant in particular, is reliant on the lawyers asking, the labs providing, and it making it, you know, two or three stops down the road to get to the person for whom it is intended. So this would be a huge technology project, but it would be well worth the investment, we think. Uh, at least the public labs to start. We haven't talked about the private labs because the public labs are the ones that are, I mean, private labs can be retained by the state, of course, that happens. Um, we would need to talk about extending it to the private labs, but the first stop is the publicly funded labs that currently, frankly, may be sitting on or having possession of information that would be Morton Act, but if it's not asked for, they may not even know or realize or appreciate that it's sitting there in the case record. And if the lawyers don't ask for it, then that's a problem. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? You can't modify the data for the news access. Being on the back portal. side of motions for new trials as long as it's like that, where both well, state and defense have access to request this evidence from places like DPS. And then from the prosecutor perspective, later on, someone's saying, well, they didn't request it, and then how that works in terms of if we both have equal access to the evidence, is that a Michael Morton violation as opposed to more of an ineffective assistance sort of issue? Um, well, I think the thought is if, if the ultimate representative of the defendant has access to everything and then they, you know, don't open the file, then that's at least the lab has done its part by making the information available. And so then on the back end, it's a question of, you know, was the defense lawyer given access in a timely manner? You know, did, did they have the information and so forth? Um, but at least it's there and accessible. And then the defense lawyer can say, well, based on all this, I need an expert or I don't. Or, you know, it, it just provides, it actually, you know, it will make the spirit and the letter of Michael Morton into reality, whereas right now everything is dependent on requests for discovery. I think that, yes, it is dependent, well, yes, it's, it's under the discovery statute, 14, so it is dependent on discovery. Um, it's just that I don't know, and granted, I wasn't in the room when the legislature was uh, back in 2014 when it finally went into place, but when we're talking about these cases, I think that the thought was that we want to prevent injustices like Michael Morton. I don't know if they thought about the everyday DWI case and the explosion of documents that was going to happen as we went down this road. Not saying that we shouldn't, it's just that it is, when, it is a massive undertaking. When you're talking about misdemeanor cases that are the bread and butter of criminal prosecution and creating a portal like that, it is going to exponentially change that. Now the portal helps. And, to be fair, this massive undertaking is of course massive money is going to help prosecutors because that's going to be less things. If the defense has access to it, they can look that stuff up. That relieves the burden from prosecutors <coughs> of what they have to turn over, what they're responsible for. So it's just a massive undertaking. Yeah, I mean, I think one, one thing that has added to the need for this is the Richard Miles Act was passed last, sex, you know, last session, which requires law enforcement to certify that they've given everything. And a lot of our labs are attached to law enforcement agencies. And so question whether the representatives from those agencies who are signing off are thinking about the records in the lab. They may not even be thinking about it. And so is the certification complete? It might not be. So that's, that's, a, that's a question 
because I'm not sure if those certifications are specific to certain departments of the PD or the law enforcement agency or if it's just the agency as a whole signing off but then the investigators may have forgotten that the lab may also have records. So there's, there are a number of, of issues here. Um, and of course, the way the, the technology works is, for example, if you get assigned as counsel to a case and you submit your email, it will alert you if something has been added, for example. So if you have a complex homicide and four different units in the lab are working it, as more stuff gets added, you, you know, your email gets notified. So it's, you know, can, it's real time information. It's not going to be cheap, but I think it is well, well worth it. Yes. Yes. To, to the cloud. So you're That's all I had on that agenda item, Dr. Bernard. All right, is there any public comment? <coughs> I take that as a no. Uh, the next meeting will be October 7th. Do I have a motion oh, to? Um, hold, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Kerrigan would like to say oh, something. Okay. I just wanted to mention something at the tail end of the TACLED update, um, just to give credit to Texas DPS for something that they're volunteering with. So um, I think s several people are aware that there's an effort to develop universal checklists for um, conformance to OSAC registry standards. And this is separate from the portal that um, Lynn mentioned. Anything else? I All right. Think, I think Dr. Kerrigan's frozen. Is she okay? Yeah. She's she stopped the midstream. Seemed like an incomplete thought. So. Yeah. Document and implementation towards conforming to the mm -hmm. standards. So gap analysis and also to be used. Oop. Here we go again. I think we might have got. We might have lost the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know. Well, I, I can finish what Dr. Kerrigan was saying because I know what she's talking about. DPS has been helping with the development of these checklists, and it's really helpful for the labs. Um, and I, I think that HFSC has. Sure that oh, people are aware going. of that. Uh, we're anticipating a very large number of checklists by the end of this fiscal year, the end of this federal fiscal year, but Texas DPS are assisting with uh, the beta testing there. And Erica Zemak from the Houston Forensic Science Center um, from the quality division there has been um, working with us for many months now as part of the task group that was developing those checklists. So I think it's great news. It's going to be a very valuable resource that's being developed as part of this cooperative agreement between NIST and the Academy. And I wanted to give Texas DPS credit for their help with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I think she's through. Um, all right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Someone. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adjourned. I can't believe that was so fast. That just means we were, no, we're so, I've only heard about a third of what she was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I heard from now on you have to you have to have a No, I I I think we don't know how you got it. <laughs> I also yeah, know the, the okay. volume of, uh, I yes. don't think they're prepared for it. I think it's across the board. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah you told me about it. I'm hanging in there. It's like a tail of the mic. It's just like.